Claims-based authorization in .NET is a hidden gem, but the reality is you don't really get a lot of useful claims from an external identity provider like Google or Microsoft. Now, Google doesn't know anything about your user or their security rights or your tenants. And most of us, we manage security with roles and groups, not by individual user. So where's that information going to come from? So hold on, keep listening, because I've got a slick solution for you, and I think you're going to like it. My name's Jeff Zerlang, and I've been a DBA and a developer for quite a while. So I'm here to share with you some of the things I've learned along the way. So please like and subscribe to my channel. And if you want to learn more about SQL Server and .NET development, visit my blog, betterwithcode.com where you can request to be notified about blog posts and video releases. Enough self-promotion, let's get to it. My favorite solution to getting application-specific claims data about a user is to implement a middleware component. It sits in the ASP.NET pipeline and decorates the user's claims identity. Now, maybe that's something you're not familiar with, so let's talk about the ASP.NET core request pipeline. Boy, that's hard to say. So when a request comes in, there's a series of components that get invoked to process the request. Typically in your program.cs file, you'll define stages of the pipeline that you want to use. And that could include things like authentication or HTTPS redirection. What's great about this design is that one of those stages can decide to end the processing of the request. If the request was just looking for a static file, like, a, like an image, then the remaining components don't need to be invoked. And that's important to us because it avoids doing work that's not needed. It boosts performance. Even better, we can add custom components to the pipeline that can alter the HTTP request context. What's that? That context is like a bag of information. It contains information about the user, the HTTP headers, the body of the request, all kinds of useful stuff. What's important to us is that we can add claims to the user's identity in the HTTP request context before it gets to the authorization component. So let's take a look at what that might look like. In this situation, I might have a user of an application that interacts with multiple tenants. And that user might have different rights depending on the tenant. So when the user is in the application, they need to select a tenant that they're working on. And when that request comes in, I need to see what tenant the user is interacting with and what those rights are. So let's start with a stripped down version of the middleware component, and then I'll show you a, a more complete example. So it needs to keep track of the next component in the pipeline so that it can pass the request on down when it's done. So the constructor for this class takes in a request delegate and stores it in the variable next. I also need to implement an invoke async function that takes in the HTTP context. That's that, that bag of information with all the stuff about the request. So the first thing I need to do is to check to see if the user is authenticated. And if so, we can get the user's email address. And I'm, I'm just creating an, a user object, but normally I would spin up a repository and get the user from the application's database. And, and then I can create a new claim with that email. I can also add a claim based on the path of the URL from the request. So just as an example, I could specify which tenant the user is acting on by including it in the path of the URL. Once we validated that the user is associated with the tenant, we could add a tenant to that claim. And notice that I'm not adding a claim to an existing claims identity. I actually have to create a new claims identity and add it to the user's claims principle. So just to clear that up, a user can have one claims principle but can have multiple claims identity. It's like having a driver's license and a passport. Both prove identity and have information about you. Height, weight, country of origin, claims. Okay, so now that we've got that, I can pass the request on to the next stage in the pipeline, the authorization component. Once we've defined what our custom middleware component is going to do, we need to add it to the ASP.NET uh, pipeline. And to do that, we'll just create a static extension method that takes in the application builder and add it via that application builder. So in your program.cs file, you'll probably have something that will say, uh, you know, app.use static files, 
use routing, and then use user middleware, which would be your custom component, and then use authorization. And that's all you need to do to establish that chain that uh, of middleware components for ASP.NET. To make authorization work, we need policies. And policies, they're sets of authorization requirements. So I'm going to create a policy called required tenant that simply looks for a claim called current tenant. If the user has a current tenant, they'll pass the authorization check. Now, once I've defined this policy, I can apply it to a controller or an action. And in this case, I've put that check on the privacy page. As a user, when I attempt to access that page, I have to have a tenant or I won't be able to see the page. All right, so here you can see I've got the page loaded up. I've included the current tenant in the path of the uh, URL. So now I can go ahead and I can click on the privacy page and it gets rendered and it tells me that the current tenant is 333. Uh, normally I'd have that be a GUID, but whatever. Gets the example across. All right, so now if I go ahead and remove that uh, tenant from the URL, I can click on privacy and I get access denied. That's because I failed the authorization check. There is no current tenant that is being included in my claims identity. All right, so that's a very simple implementation of a user middleware. Typically, you're going to have to go out to a repository and get some information to validate it. So here's an example of something that's a little more realistic. And in this case, uh, it's written for a web API that would interact with maybe a React front end or an Angular front end. So instead of passing it in as a URL, maybe the tenant good would be passed in via an HTTP header. And so in this case, I've defined a title for the uh, HTTP header and I have a function that can go ahead and extract it from the header. All right, so let's take a look at this invoke async function because that's really the meat and potatoes of this middleware component. And what I do is I go ahead and use dependency injection to pass in an instance of a, a unit of work for EF core. And then I can go ahead and extract the user ID from the HTTP context. So once I've got those things, now I can go ahead and create a new repository. I can include a filter, a specification to get the user by the external ID that came in on the uh, initial claims identity. And as I have that, then I'll have a user object that has all the information about what tenants that user is able to access. It may have all of the uh, security rights that that user is given for that tenant. You can go ahead and get that information from your repository. And so now I can go ahead and create a new claims identity and add that current tenant to it and whatever else I needed to. Then I can just add that to the claims principle and I'm going to have all of that information available for authorization checks in my application. I've seen authorization implemented in a lot of different ways, but the more I've used this method, the more I like it. Authorization policies are easy to test and you get the benefit of pipeline short circuiting to boost performance. Decorating the claims principle means you have a central point to add security related metadata about a user. It doesn't matter who your identity provider is. In fact, you could use this with identity server or even the default authentication plumbing that Microsoft provides out of the box. Now, I didn't show off all the bells and whistles of Microsoft authorization, but the design allows you to do some very complex authorization rules. So it should fit the needs of most organizations. Actually, a great example of complex rules would be when you need to require a user with a role like an administrator to have multi-factor authentication enabled because the only thing more embarrassing than getting hacked is getting hacked because an administrator uses password as their password. It's happened. So watch this video and don't get hacked.